James chapter 1 in your Bible. As I mentioned, just by way of review, and I will just touch base for those who weren't here last week, so bear with me if you were, but just by way of review, the book of James here was written by Jesus Christ's half-brother James. They have the same, obviously, Mother Mary. During Jesus' life, we talked about last week that even his own brothers, the Bible says his brethren, his brothers did not believe in him. So the man here, James, who penned these words, his half-brother, did not even believe that his brother was the Messiah, that he was the Son of God. The Bible says, as you piece verses together and you study the context, that eventually when Jesus rose from the dead, he specifically appeared to James. When he appeared to James, James then believed in his brother that he was the Son of God. He indeed was the Messiah. God went on to use James in a great way. He was the first pastor of the church, in, or one of, I'm sorry, one of the pastors of the church in Jerusalem, which obviously was the first church that was started. And he was a great man of God who obviously God used to pen this epistle that we study today. Eventually his life would end as he died for his faith. He was a martyr of his faith. The religious leaders at the time did not like that he was preaching the gospel, that he was a pastor, and they persecuted him for preaching Jesus Christ. Last Sunday, as we jumped into James chapter 1, we looked at the first few verses, and we learned, as the theme is becoming spiritually mature, that a part of becoming or, or reaching that spiritually mature level in your Christian life and becoming like Christ is based on how we view and handle trials. We studied that trials teach us what? To endure, the Bible says, meaning what? They strengthen us. God works through trials to strengthen us, to become more mature Christians, to become more like Jesus Christ. Now James continues to go on in James chapter 1, and he teaches us not only do trials strengthen us and mature us, but he then begins to teach us what we should ask for when trials and tribulations and hard times come our way. Look, if you would, at James chapter 1, verse 5. We just read a few moments ago as we continue through this book of the Bible, through this epistle. The Bible says in verse 5, ready? If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. So as we continue with this thought, as we pick up where we left off last week, as James continues to teach us what it means to be mature in Christ... He says, when trials come, when confusion strikes, when hard times come your way, what should you ask God for? What should you come to God and pray for? Should you pray for relief? Should you pray for strength, grace, deliverance? Maybe none of those things are a bad thing to ask Christ or ask the Lord for when you're going through a trial. But James specifically says here in verse 5, a spiritually mature Christian asks for what? Wisdom. Wisdom. Now stick with me this morning. You're going through a trial. You're going through a hard time. You have a burden, a decision that you have to make, something in a storm that you're facing. You don't know what God is doing. What should you, what is the spiritually mature Christian go to God and ask for? James says they go and they ask for wisdom. Wisdom. Proverbs chapter 4, you don't have to turn there, verse 7 says this. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom, and with all thy getting, get understanding. The Bible says wisdom is the principal thing. Go after it and seek wisdom from God. But what exactly would you, would you define wisdom as? What is godly wisdom? What is biblical wisdom? Wisdom, simply put, can be defined as practical, moral, and spiritual insight given by God. Practical moral and spiritual insight given by God. Now I know we're getting a little heavy here this morning, but we're talking about being mature as a Christian, conforming to the image of Christ, because that's what Romans says is God's will for all of us, right? Christians mean what? Little Christ, to become more like Christ, to be growing in our faith. And the mature Christian, when they face a trial, asks for wisdom. 
But as I study this and I read this verse by James, I ask myself, okay, but why do we need wisdom when we face a trial? Why when I'm going through something where I don't know what God is doing and I get that phone call or I'm confused and I don't know what's going to happen, what direction this is going to go, why exactly do I need wisdom? Ready? If you miss anything today, don't miss this. We need wisdom so we will not waste the opportunities God is giving us to mature and conform to the image of his son. We need wisdom so God can show us exactly what he is doing. Pastor Warren Wearsby, he's not here on this earth anymore, but has a great commentary I study and gives an illustration on this verse. He says he was a pastor one time that he had a secretary who had a stroke. Then her husband went blind just out of nowhere. The husband went to the hospital and it was just a matter of time, all of a sudden, just illness struck him and the doctor said it was only going to be a few months, a few days. He didn't have much more left to live. He went on and he said that as he prayed for that family one Sunday morning, the wife came to church by herself. And so he went up to her and he said, hey, I just want you to know we're praying for you. We're, we're praying. She looked at the pastor and she said, well, what are you asking God to do exactly? He said, well, I'm asking God to help you. I'm asking God to, to strengthen you. She looked at him, she thanked him, but then she replied with this, ready? Pray that I will have the wisdom not to waste all of this. Pray that I will have the wisdom not to waste all of this. See, that lady realized the meaning of James chapter 1, verse 5. We need wisdom so we will not waste the opportunities God has given us to mature and to grow in our faith. You see, wisdom allows you to see what God is teaching you, to see what God is showing you, conforming you to his image. It's a godly insight that says, hey, I'm doing something here. It's the mature Christian who, rather than throwing in the towel, rather than running from church, running from God, they say, no, Lord, give me wisdom. Show me what you're teaching me. Show me why you brought this my way. If you continue to read that verse, it says this in verse 5. If any of you, what it says, lack wisdom. The word lack in verse 5, in the Greek, it means to be destitute, wanting, or defective. If we are defective in wisdom, we will not know how to handle the problems and trials of life when they arise. And I don't know about you, but there have been many times in my life when I have faced a trial, I have faced a situation or a circumstance where you just feel so overwhelmed. You're full of anxiety and you're full of stress and you're full of fear and you don't know what the, what the Lord is doing and the circumstance has just overwhelmed you. You feel inadequate. I can't handle this. I, I can't go through this. I don't know what to do. James says if you're there as a Christian, Ask God for wisdom. Ask God to give you wisdom. You say, Pastor, I don't even understand what that really means or what I'm really asking for. But the Bible teaches the mature Christian understands God is doing something in their life. He's taking their problems. He's working good for them, as Romans 8 teaches us. But you have to trust Him and believe and ask the Lord to give you that wisdom to show you. Notice what he says, too, in, that verse, five, in verse 5. He says, if any of you lack wisdom, he says, let him ask of God. He does not say, oh, you're going through a trial, so you need wisdom. So go down to the local bookstore and find whatever the most popular author is of the day and read their self-help book. He doesn't say, oh, you're going through a problem, you need wisdom. Make sure you call a friend or family and get counsel for them and, and, and see what they have to say. No, <laughs> he says... If you lack wisdom, ask of God. Ask of God. I, we often have this tendency when we face trials to turn to the latest trends, to look here, to look there for help, when the real wisdom we need as a Christian is right in front of us, and that is God, our Heavenly Father. Don't let the trials and circumstances of life sidetrack you from seeking God. Seek Him, pursue Him, know Him, and let Him give you the wisdom that you need 
to endure your trial, to grow you as a Christian, to conform you to the image of his son, Jesus Christ. You see, God is the best source of true wisdom for us as believers. And the wisdom of God, where is the wisdom of God found? We could do a whole sermon on that. <laughs> but the wisdom of God is found, the Bible teaches clearly, obviously through prayer, you're going to him. But the main source of God's wisdom, ready, is found right here. Is found in this book. Which is why many times on a Sunday I beat this drum heavily. And that's have a relationship with God's word. To ask God to make us wise and yet ignore the book of wisdom he has put in our hands is simply, can I say this kindly? Stupidity. <laughs> it's unreasonable. We're going through a trial. We need wisdom. We're, we're, we're seeking God and we keep our Bibles closed. We don't study God's word. That's unrealistic. We need wisdom for this life. We need wisdom for our trials. And the mature Christian understands that. And so they get in God's word and study it and read it and meditate on it. Psalm 119, 98 through 99 says this. Thou through thy commandments has made me wiser than mine enemies. For they are ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for thy testimonies are my meditation. Listen, understand this morning. The Bible holds all authority in the Christian's life. Biblical authority in the Christian's life. As a Christian, I'm for commentaries, and I'm for devotionals, and I'm for reading books, and, and even good books by good Christian people, and, and good podcasts, and, and all for that. But that should not trump in the Christian's life the relationship they have with their Bible. Know your Bible, read your Bible, study your Bible, memorize your Bible, highlight your Bible. Let God speak to you through His Word. You see, I talk to young people often as a youth pastor and, and even in young couples my age and of all walks of life, but they come and I try to let them understand and, and, and make them realize that the Bible speaks on all aspects of our life, social, secular, spiritual. It's all here. It's clear. It makes no mistakes. It won't return void. And if we, all we do is ignore it or read it in church, we're going through a trial and we know we need wisdom, but we ignore God's word. That's the sign of an immature Christian. That's the sign of a Christian who's not growing in the Lord. You're going through something this morning. Get in God's word. Have a practical game plan to read God's word. Hey, and maybe many of you have worked here the last few weeks, or maybe you were, but have a place where you start every day to read God's word. On the back table there, we have a Bible reading plan. It's a chronological reading of the Bible, in the, in the, in, you're reading it the way it was written historically, and it's just a plan that helps you navigate through God's Word. Have a game plan where you're seeking God's Word every single day. Proverbs is known as the book of wisdom. So oftentimes in my life, whatever the day of the week is, today is what? January 22nd, right? January 22nd, so I'm going to read Proverbs 22 today. Tomorrow is January 23rd, so I'm going to read Proverbs 23. Whatever it is, have a game plan to get in God's word and to seek and to meditate. Rather than focusing on your issues and looking for help and wisdom and trying to figure it out on your own and trying to manipulate the situation, when you feel overwhelmed, when you feel inadequate, when you feel hopeless, when you don't know what left, you're left to do, get in God's book. Get in the Bible. Seek the Lord. If any of you lack wisdom, he says... Ask of God. Notice what he continues to go on there in verse 5. He says, That giveth to all men liberally. You see, God is a generous Father. He gives generously. Think about a generous Father. Think if you, 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 know, you grew up, or you just think if you have children yourself, right? And I'm learning this the hard way. They come up and they ask you something, and you want to give them what they ask for. You know, he's eating dinner in the high chair, and he knows bedtime is next, and he knows the right things to say. I'm telling you, he's getting smart. But he'll say, my wife will say, all right, it's bedtime, Luke, that's it, it's, it's time to go to bed. And he'll look, oh, can I watch, last night, can I watch football with Dad? Dad? How do I say no to that? He knows. <laughs> and a generous father says, you know, yeah, of course, it's fine, let him come watch football with me for, for a little bit. A generous father wants to give to their children. They want to provide. They don't want to hold anything back. And ten times more, is that your heavenly father 
who loves you and knows you and wants to give generously to you. He's not going to hold anything back. If you go to God in your trial, in the situation you're facing, with sincerity and humility of heart, and you ask God for wisdom, you can't exhaust his supply of it. He will give it to you. The Bible continues to go on in verse 5. It says, liberally, and what does it say next? And abradeth not, and it shall be given him. You see, abradeth not, meaning what? God is not out to mock us. He's not out to belittle us. He's ready to help. He's ready to aid. He's ready to provide wisdom to a humble heart that simply approaches him and says, I don't know what left to do, God. I need your help, and I need your guidance. And when a Christian comes to that point, God is there. He will work. He will show you. He will open doors. Maybe not right away, but you keep coming. You keep asking and understand you have a heavenly father who loves you and will give you wisdom and will give you that insight. James goes on, verse 6, what does he say there? But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. Ask in faith, the Bible says. Confidence in who God is and that he will answer you and show you. Reminding yourself that he is faithful to his promises. He is working to conform us to the image of his son and trusting him that he's in total control of what you're facing in your life this morning. But I think it's interesting as James says here that phrase, nothing wavering. He says, ask in faith, nothing wavering. Isn't that where we live oftentimes in our lives if we're being honest with ourselves? He says nothing wavering. What does that mean? We're back and forth. <laughs> Between belief in God, I'm all in for church, I'm reading my Bible, and then the next day it's like, I don't know about that. Uh, I don't know. God's not answering me. I don't know. I, I don't know what to think about that. We waver. We're back and forth in belief. We're back and forth in unbelief. James describes it like a wave being tossed around by the wind. Toss, being thrown around, varying between up and down, unstable, chaotic. I don't know about you, but that sounds like me in the midst of my trials. Up and down, chaotic, anxious, don't know what's going on, full of uncertainty. So many times, we know we should have faith. We know what the Bible says. We know that we should ask God for wisdom. We know what we're supposed to do when trials strike. But yet, we wander all over the place. We don't stay in God's word. We don't make a priority to be in church. We don't have a life of prayer. We're not seeking and trusting God. And then we, we wonder, what is God doing in all this? Well, God's trying to show you, but you have to seek him. You have to know him. Can I encourage you? Can I implore to you here this morning? Make it a point in 2023 that you decide you're not going to be a wavering Christian. A wavering Christian is a sign of an immature Christian. And yeah, we're all there. We've all been there at points of our life where no one's going to be perfect. But let 2023 be the year you decide, you know what? I'm going to be all in for God. I'm going to be all in for God. When trial strikes, I'm going to trust and I'm going to seek him. Whether it's the mountain, whether it's the valley, whether it's the good time, whether it's the bad time, I'm going to cling to Christ. I'm going to have a relationship with this book. I'm going to have a life of prayer. I'm going to walk with God. I'm going to have my family in church. I'm going to raise my kids in the Lord. I'm going to go all in for God. Nothing wavering. Don't be that Christian. When trials strike, as James describes, you're wandering. We're tossed around all over the place. James reminds us that when trials come and wisdom is needed, we must ask and pursue God in faith. Because if we fall into the unbelief wavering tossed category, he goes on to tell us there are consequences for being an immature Christian when you're tossed all over the place. What are those consequences? Look at verse 7. He says, Verse 6, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. And notice what he says in verse 7. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. Not only will we suffer the effects of doubt in our mind and spirit when we don't ask for God, when we don't ask in faith, when we don't seek God in the midst of our trials, but when we don't look to the Lord in faith and trust, then how can we expect him to answer we look around and we scratch our heads and God, what are you doing? And God, why aren't, you, why aren't you helping me? Why aren't you delivering me? And God looks back and says, when's the last time you were in my book? When's the last time you asked me for wisdom? 
When's the last time you made me the preeminence in your life? Instead, we go all over the place, wavering, tossed around like a wave in the sea, and then we wonder why God's not working in our life. God is standing there this morning, ready to work in your life. He wants to work in your family. He wants to work in your marriage. He wants to work in your relationships. He wants to work in the trials that you're facing. But ready? Here's the secret. You have to ask Him. you got to get Him involved. you got to pursue Him and ask Him in faith and not leave Him out of the equation. Go to God and seek Him. Remember, the theme is what, James? Spiritual maturity. The spiritually mature Christian is not living between belief and unbelief, in and out of the book, in and out of prayer. No, they're clinging to the Lord. They're seeking Him in everything that they go through. You know, there's a consistency in their life. There's a consistency of faith in the spiritually mature Christian. In the Christian who's growing in the image of Jesus Christ and conforming to the Son of God, there's a consistency there. Are you perfect? No. Are we going to mess up? Of course. But there's a consistent heartbeat of faith. There's a foundation of faith in their life that leads them and guides them through their life. And my prayer to you for New Heights Baptist Church and for every member or visitor that walks through those back doors is that that can describe your life. Consistent faith, not wavering, growing in Christ, conforming to the image of his son. So that no matter what you're going through, whether it's the valley or whether it's the mountaintop, that God can use you and can work through what you're going through. Strive to live a life of faith, faith in God. And I'll be honest with you, that's a hard place to live as human beings. It's a hard place. Let's just be real this morning. None of us are perfect. We're not here to put on a show. We come to church and we try, but it's hard Monday morning when you wake up and the conference calls and and the Google Meets and the Zoom calls and the emails come flooding in and the stress of life and the kids in school and making sure the kids are good and, and their teachers and their grades and their lives are put together and your spouse is good and your family is good and man, it just gets very overwhelming. It's hard to live a consistent faith when you go through this life, but the spiritually mature Christian slows down and says, no matter what, I need to be daily seeking God with my life. Whether it's 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, I need to be in my book. I need to be praying and talking to God throughout my day. I need to ask God for wisdom so that he can lead me in this life, so that he can lead me through the trials that I'm going through. Because the wavering Christian tossed around, what does he say in verse 7? Don't think you're going to receive anything of the Lord. Because you're not factoring God into your life. Verse 8. He says this to go on with that thought. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. What's a double-minded man? One commentator put it this way, so I'm going to read it to you because I think it's a great definition. He whose schemes are divided between God and the world. He who cannot cheerfully and resolutely commit himself in confidence of divine support to be led wheresoever providence shall please to lead him. They are unsettled in all their ways. They be running to inconsistencies of conduct. And these imperfect and undetermined impressions of religion which he feels will serve rather to perplex and torment rather than to guide and secure him. Can I simply put that, what we just talked about a few moments ago, a double-minded man is one who's caught between God and the world. And the Bible says those, that's a sign of a spiritually immature Christian, and that's one where you're tormented, you're confused, you're beat up. It's unstable because you have one foot in church and in, in God and one foot in this world. Hey, I'm not saying you have to go out in this world and be a religious zealot and a Bible thumper, and preaching, and and banging people over the head with the Bible. But there should be something different about you as a Christian. There should be something different that stands out about you. When a co-worker looks at you, they should see a peace in your life, a light in your eye. They should see something different about you. Hey, you know what? They don't partake in those dirty jokes. They They don't talk that way. There's something different about them. Why? Because you decided, I'm going to be all in for God. Not that I'm perfect or not, oh, I'm good, look at me. But no, I just want to be more like Jesus Christ. And I want him to work in my family. I want him to work in my life. And I want him to work in my trials. So I'm going to cling to him. And I'm going to ask him for wisdom. And I'm going to cling to his word. And I'm going to make him a priority in my life. That is the sign of a spiritually mature Christian. And a spiritually mature Christian experiences God in a very real and powerful way. And I want that for all of you this morning. 
I want God to be real in your life. I want God to lead you through your trials. I want you to be able to impact your family and your friends and your children for the Lord Jesus Christ. I want Him to work in your issues, but you have to decide that for yourself. I can want it, I can pray for it, I can preach it, and I'm talking to myself this morning, but it's up to you, it's up to me to live it, to commit, and decide, you know what, I'm not going to be a double-minded Christian. I'm going to be all in to the best of my ability, and with the help and strength of the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm going to be all in for God. And if for any other reason this morning, parents, grandparents, can I talk to you for a moment? For your children's sake, let them see parents and grandparents that choose the Lord. Let us point the next generation in the direction of God where they can find hope and peace and purpose in this life. The sign of an immature Christian, unstable in all their ways. And can I say that's a very scary place to live in this life. But you don't have to be there. As we submit to the Lord and we trust Him through our trials, we will find that His wisdom and His way is far better than us scheming, trying to figure things out on our own. I don't know what you're facing this morning. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what burden weighs heavy on your heart, on your mind. But I, don't, I do know this. There's a God in heaven who loves you. There's a God in heaven, if you're a saved believer of Jesus Christ this morning, that is your heavenly and spiritual Father. And he's working in your life to conform you to the image of his son. He's growing you as a Christian. And he's looking for you to pursue him, to seek him, to get in his word, and to ask him for wisdom to lead you through the trials of life. And man, when trials come, as we talked about last Sunday, they make you endure, they strengthen you. But when God gives you that wisdom, when God gives you that insight, he'll become very real in your life. It won't just be a game. He'll start to answer prayer. Stores will start to open. Relationships will be restored. God will work in a powerful way. We can continue to go on through James chapter 1. We'll stop there for sake of time this morning. But if I can say to you this as we will continue through this book the next few weeks and talking about being a spiritually mature Christian, can I plead with you if you're facing a trial this morning, ask God for wisdom. We need wisdom so we'll not waste the opportunities God has given us to mature in Christ. You're facing a trial this morning? Seek and ask God for wisdom and help. Remember that phrase, ask of God. Don't ask of the world. Don't ask of a self-help book. Don't ask of friends and family before you go and ask of God. Ask Him to show you. God is a generous God. He wants to give, provide, and show you the way this morning. But you have to come to Him asking in faith. Decide this morning, I'm done. And decide, hey, I'm going to quit playing games with God. I'm going to quit in and out, one foot in, one foot out, one side trusting God, other side leaning on my own understanding. All that leads to is chaos, as the Bible says, instability, and an immature Christian. Why don't you decide this year, this week, I'm going to let go and I'm going to let God. And I'm going to submit to Him and ask Him for wisdom and let God show you the way in your life. He will use your trial to strengthen you and make you more like his son, Jesus Christ, if you let him.